<laughs> I want to thank you all, uh, both for having me and for uh, listening to my request to have a nice big podium. Uh, I really can't speak anywhere unless I have a giant heavy podium in front of me. And I'm like, whether or not it works. Well, it's past your birthday. Um, but also, and this is much more serious, I had no idea about the whole small group challenge to raise money for CFW scholarships for HSBC. That means a ton to me. When, when I was listening to the announcement about CFW, I was like, dang it, there's so many people I want to be there, and I know that they're not going to be able to afford it. I don't know how I'm going to get all those scholarships together for them. So uh, I don't know who initiated that. I don't know how many of you are planning on being a part of it. Um, but I just wanted to say thanks in advance, even just for thinking. So, um, it means a whole lot to me. <clears throat> and I don't want to get emotional about it yet, so let's just move on. So I am uh, I'm 27. I am getting married in a couple months. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Um, so suddenly, I am starting to feel pretty old, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, I mean, with age comes maturity and wisdom and all that, so that's cool and all. But it comes at the expense of coolness. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, nothing, nothing scares me about getting old quite as much as the idea of losing my coolness. Now, this isn't because I think that I am a particularly cool person. In fact, it's actually just the opposite. I have so little coolness to begin with, <laughs> that even just losing the smallest amount will leave me completely uncool, you know, like our parents. <laughs> when did parents get to be so uncool? Anyway, <laughs> 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 that makes no sense. No, seriously, is there like a certain age where parents like cross the line from awesome to embarrassing? 37. School. 37. <laughs> All right. I'm not nearly as worried about it as because I'm worried that I'm getting dangerously close to that line, but I still got 10 years for 37. Um, wait, is this microphone actually on? No. Oh, no. Just, no. What's causing that echo? That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> I just had to push copy. That's all. Uh, so I, I was in second grade when my parents turned 27. And that actually was the year that they became uncool. I remember that day, that exact day, very well. Um, my school had been hosting this series where different students' parents would come in and they would teach us all some sort of skill or trait or something from their uh, profession. So for instance, one of my friend's dad worked at a pizza shop. Uh, so he came in and taught us all how to throw the pizza dough in the air. It was pretty cool. And, more parents uh, who were bankers or electricians or whatever would come in and teach us some basic skill from their job. It was it was like career day, only stretched out across the course of an entire school year. Um, to be honest, it was pretty forgettable and usually really boring. Mm. <laughs> it was a nice day. However, the day that was not boring was the day that my mom and dad were scheduled to come. To school. <laughs> I was honestly really excited about this day. I was convinced that everyone in my class was going to just love my mom and dad. Um, my, my parents were in charge of the children's programming at my church. So my dad was professionally trained to entertain and impress second graders. <laughs> he, uh, he could juggle, he could make balloon animals, he could do magic tricks, he could do jokes, he could host games, all of that stuff. He was basically like a clown except not creepy and over the top. <laughs> and instead, he would teach us about Jesus and stuff. Uh, so I had really good reason to think that my parents were pretty awesome. Then they came to school. And I remember pointing proudly to my friend, that's my mom and dad up there. And they got up in front of the class, and they led this little workshop on how to use puppets. That was another thing that they were good at. And so they went through all these different skills, like, how to make them talk, not like this, like this, and how to pick the voices for your puppets, and how to choose the characteristics and the personalities of your different characters. And naturally, I thought this was all really legit. And I was super proud of myself when I got to go up in front of the class and demonstrate some of the skills that I had learned from my parents. It wasn't until that moment, about halfway through this song, that my parents 
Harrington I had prepared, that I noticed that the smiles on my classmates' faces were not the sincere smiles of genuine enjoyment. They were the evil, condescending <laughs> smirks of kids who thought that the three of us, and maybe me especially, were about as lame as it gets. They weren't laughing with us. They were laughing at us, at my uncool parents, at uncool Okay, so those of you who are like particularly feeling people the way I am uh, are feeling at least a little bit of embarrassment on my behalf, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I want you to hold on to that feeling. Keep on cringing. <laughs> because because that's the exact same emotion that I felt in small group a few weeks ago. So let me set this scene for you. Uh, it was a particularly diverse Bible study this day. Um, and I mean that not just ethnically, but culturally and religiously as well. I mean, I always tell people that I meet in the student center or wherever that our small groups are communities where everyone is welcome. Um, and maybe even including and especially people who are not Christians. But people don't often take me up on that promise. But this day, they did. Uh, there were the few usual members, a couple girls who lead um, different activities in their church, this one particularly conservative Christian guy who occasionally speaks in these and vows, uh, <laughs> and this girl who believes in Jesus but also believes in a large list of other things including uh, unicorns and mermaids. Uh, <laughs> those, are, those are the usual. And then we had a few uh, guests, um, a couple of Muslim guys named uh, Abdul and Abdullah. Uh, that's aren't their real names, but I'm trying to protect some identities here. And an agnostic girl who, as she told me just the week before, was really just looking for a place where she could figure out exactly what it is she did. So the eight of us sitting around this table represented some drastically different understandings of who Jesus was and what God was up to in the world. Which, of course, made me really happy. This is the kind of moment that I live in. It's exactly this kind of stuff that made me choose to join InterVarsity in the first place. I was so excited for our little group to meet Jesus ourselves, for everyone around the table to see who Jesus really is. I sincerely love Jesus, and I couldn't wait to introduce him to the rest of the table. So I passed out our story for today, uh, a little passage from Luke 14, and we all began to read it out loud. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, this was, this was the moment where they were all going to hear Jesus for themselves. I really just hoped they would love him as much as I did. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Shoot. <laughs> I forgot that we were studying this story today. I squirmed a little in my seat as the person next to me continued reading. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. No, stop. What are you doing? Dang it, Jesus. <laughs> stop saying this stuff. Uh, I, I, I thought about actually just cutting it off and throwing out the Bible study for the day or swapping in another story real quick. But now we're going to look at this one said about love and stuff. Uh, but it was, it was too late. The story had already begun to work its way around the table without me. One of the new students, actually, was up next for the reading. And so he picked it up where we left off, clearly already a little bit alarmed. Uh, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able, with 10,000 men, to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you 
who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? At this point, the reading had come back around to me. I mumbled the last couple sentences without daring to look up from my little sheet of paper. It is neither fit for the soil nor the manure pile. It is thrown out. <coughs> Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Everyone uh, took a couple minutes in silence to jot down notes and observation and all of that. It was the most nervous, awkward silence I have ever experienced as a small group leader. And then, as it was bound to do, eventually our little quiet time ran up, and I opened up the conversation as I open up pretty much every discussion in my life with the following prompt. <laughs> so, <laughs> what in this story surprised you, and what questions did it raise? As you might imagine, the next few moments were pretty chaotic. Literally every sentence in this story raised questions for her and surprised all of us. One of the church kids kicked it off by saying, I was surprised that Jesus told us to hate people. But it couldn't literally mean hate here, right? I bet it's just a bad translation. Everyone looked at me expectantly, and I had to say, no. I checked every translation I could find, and they all say hate. I even checked the original Greek, and the word literally means the opposite of love. How could he say that then? Abdullah interjected. Parents are meant to be respected. We have this proverb heaven is at the feet of our mothers. I really like that. I wish Jesus had said that. I replied by telling him that I agree, and that Moses agrees, and that Paul agrees, and that Jesus' followers have always placed a high priority on honoring and loving our parents. And uh, what about that part where he says to hate our own life? Another girl asked. I used to hate myself. It's really unhealthy. No one should hate their life. By this point, I had jumped from answering questions to adding on to them. So I pointed out that Jesus had earlier said to love our neighbors and even our enemies as ourselves. How are we supposed to do that if we hate ourselves? The agnostic girl spoke up next. And what's all this about carrying a cross? Is that like a symbol or something? Like those little cross necklaces that people wear? No, oh, that's a thing, Abdullah interjected. Crosses were meant for killing people back then. Nobody would have worn it as jewelry. Agreed. Nothing would have been as gruesome or scandalous to these people in this story as a cross. Even the, uh, the these and thous kids joined in. Why is Jesus giving advice for building towers? And why the heck is he talking about going to war? Except for he didn't say that. Um, Abdul said that that part actually made a lot of sense to him because there are comparable stories about Muhammad gathering men together to go to war. And I wanted to interject and say, you know, Jesus actually is pretty actively opposed to warfare. But <laughs> the, uh, the mermaid girl had begun to talk. And so I her, she, she threw in, while we're at it, uh, what is Jesus saying about salt losing its saltiness? It doesn't even make sense. <laughs> Everyone at the table suddenly got really quiet and looked at me. Apparently expecting me to have all the answers to these questions. And so I started by just staring back at everyone. <laughs> but that didn't solve anything. <laughs> so, flustered and a little stressed, I pretty much picked one question at random. Uh, let's start with the question about the tower. Actually, this reminds me of something. There is this big hole near where I used to work in Chicago. It's in one of the nicest, most expensive areas of the city. When I moved there, I saw this big hole and assumed that it was a construction project of some sort, but as the year went on, I never saw anyone working there. It wasn't 